We're going to be in the book of Daniel, chapter 4. We're walking through this book at, at somewhat of a, a swift pace, trying to get something of an overview. Obviously, each chapter could <laughs> be worthy of extended study and actually would encourage you as members of this church to do that. As I'm, as I'm trying to give an overview of these chapters, there's passages and sections and even verses that could be worth extended study in private and would encourage you. So I would encourage you after each message, go back and just meditate through the passage in your own quiet times, your own devotions. You'll, you'll benefit from more in-depth study uh, of each chapter as we walk through it. But Daniel chapter 4 this morning, uh, I recently was building a gate in my backyard. And if you know me, you know that's a, that's a, that is a dangerous proposition um, because I know almost nothing about building. But I was determined to build this gate to protect a garden we were trying to cultivate in the backyard and to keep the critters out of it. And I don't know how to build anything, but I do know how to ask advice. So I asked advice to people that do know how to build things, and they informed me that I definitely needed a deep hole for the posts of this gate, and I needed cement. And certainly the hole was deeper than I had been assuming, and there was more cement, and cement was needed even for a little gate. They said, look, if you don't, if you don't have this deep enough, your gate eventually is going to wear down. It's going to decline the day in and day out use. It's, it's just not going to function as well. Eventually, it'll begin to sag. So I followed their advice. I dug this hole deep. I poured cement in and got those posts as solid as I knew how to do it. And it's a little bit disturbing to me that my building project is encased in cement, because any real builder that comes over would think you should never cement anything you do. <laughs> uh, but it's there. It's, it's settled. It's established. It's not going anywhere. That gate is fixed. And it reminded me of the goal that this chapter has for a particular doctrinal conviction in our hearts. If I can put it this way, this chapter, which is a, a testimony from a king, you might describe this chapter. Nebuchadnezzar's giving a, a testimony, a publication, is all that chapter 4 is in the book of Daniel. And the goal of this testimony, this publication, is to help us to establish a particular conviction as well and to cement it so that our faith doesn't move, doesn't sag, doesn't decline with the day in and day out temptations that all of us face. We need a particular conviction. And this king who publishes this testimony wants us to cement it in our souls. We're going to read his testimony in, in sections. The way I'm going to do this message is, is read through the various sections and comment briefly on each section, and then I'm going to look at four applications for us. How do we apply the overall story, the overall point, the conviction that he is trumpeting out to his kingdom, to his citizens through the story? So let's walk through it one section at a time, and then we'll eventually get to some application. Daniel chapter 4, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. Now, immediately upon reading of the opening three verses, we notice a change, a switch from the first three chapters of this book, which I've seen Nebuchadnezzar as somewhat dull and eventually able to acknowledge the obvious that these four captives that he's brought into his kingdom know a God that has impressive abilities. He can rescue from fire. He can interpret mysteries that no one else could know. But in this chapter, the opening communicates a, a different scope of his awareness. There's an abruptness. There's even a, an urgency about his proclamation, a, a, a humility even, that Emperor Nebuchadnezzar is declaring a higher kingdom, a 
more enduring kingdom, a dominion that endures from one generation to the next. Now, you'll notice in this passage, it begins and it ends with a declaration of praise from Nebuchadnezzar. And in the middle of that bracket is basically a three-part story telling how he came to this conclusion. But the king wants there to be no doubt about the point of the story. He puts it right up front. He wants them to know, here's the conviction I want you to understand. God God rules over all. You must cultivate a conviction of the absolute sovereignty of God. And he says it right up front. He doesn't want anyone to miss it. And then he tells the story of how he came to believe that. Let's keep reading. Verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me, and they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came in, and I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. At last, Daniel came in before me, he who was named Belteshazzar after the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream, saying, O oh, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and that no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me the visions of my dream that I saw, and their interpretation. The visions of my head as I lay in bed were these. I saw, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong, and its top reached to heaven, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. And I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven, and he proclaimed aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven." Let his portion be with the beasts and the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's and let a beast's mind be given to him and let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men." This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw, and you, O Belteshazzar, tell me the interpretation, because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. The king has another dream. It has a striking image in this dream. There's a, a tree, you might call it a cosmic tree, that fills the earth and it's a good tree. It provides shade and protection and even food for all flesh, it says, on the earth. There's something all-consuming and central about this tree. A cosmic tree was not unknown in the thinking of this time, so this would not have been a, a totally foreign image for the king. But he dreams that what's shocking, though, is that a holy one comes down from heaven and declares, this tree's time has come to an end. And for all of his abundance, it will now be dramatically reversed. It will be chopped down. The leaves will be stripped. The shade will be removed. All will flee from it, it says. And then a further surprise. This tree seems to represent a person. A person who was a tree providing shelter and food for all. Glory that extends even to the heavens will now be turned into even less than a man. He will become a beast, it says. Verse 16 says his mind will be changed and a beast's mind will be given to him and there will be a season of time. Seven is a, a number that often represents completeness or fullness in the Bible. 
We can think of the fact that God rested on the seventh day, and there's this idea that seven is a a fullness. So there's this full period of time when he will be in this beast-like state, and the sentence is declared for this purpose. You want to notice this phrase down there in verse 17, that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. That phrase is repeated several other times in each movement of this section. That seems to be the point of this dream. Whatever it means, whoever this is, and you have to imagine that King Nebuchadnezzar had a hint in the dream of who this could be. His urgency might indicate that. He wants to know right now who is this person who will be stripped of everything and then left as a stump in a field bound with bronze and iron to the effect that all the earth will know that the Most High rules. Then we hear what Daniel says in interpretation. Let's look at verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. And the king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you, Belteshazzar answered and said, My Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. The tree you saw which grew and became strong so that its top reached to heaven and it was visible to the end of the whole earth whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant and which was food for all under which beasts of the field found shade and in whose branches the birds of the heavens lived. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field and let him be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King, that you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. The interpretation of this dream indicates that God has measured Nebuchadnezzar and found him wanting. He has determined that his greatness has come to an end. That though his greatness extends to the ends of the earth, and there's a kind of a, a cosmic power and almost a, a, almost a God-like ability that Nebuchadnezzar has to provide and protect and overrule all nations, yet in the end he is just a man. And God has determined that this man has come to a point of humiliation. And he will be left like a stump in a field. We don't know exactly what the bronze and iron means. Most likely it means that there's a, there's a bondage that will be placed on this man. And a beast-like existence for the very emperor of the world to be driven from men seems impossible. It seems absurd. No wonder Daniel was alarmed. You notice in, in the book of Daniel in general, Daniel has a, a compassion toward this man who tore him out of his homeland. Instructive for us as Christians that in spite of Nebuchadnezzar's cruelty, in spite of Nebuchadnezzar's oppression, Daniel has a genuine desire to see God do good to him. And he appeals to him. 
to repent. Daniel, like all good prophets of Israel, knew that the warning of God was intended to lead people to repentance, that it's an opportunity to turn, that if there's, if there's a warning but it hasn't taken place yet, that interim is a time of repentance. It's a time of bowing. And so he says, Nebuchadnezzar, you must break off from your sinful way of ruling and you must cease being an oppressor. You must show mercy to the needy. You must, Nebuchadnezzar. God on high has called you uh, a, a tree that will be chopped down and left as a stump. The, the only thing you can do is to, to turn and let your kingship better reflect the king who put you in place. Turn, he says, that perhaps God may be merciful and this judgment will not fall on you. Unfortunately, Nebuchadnezzar, like so many, hears the warning and ignores it. Verse 28, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. It is almost impossible, certainly very difficult, for a citizen of this country to relate to the shocking reversal this would be. Uh, our leaders are in place uh, for eight years in this country. Other leaders uh, have limitations on their power in this day and age of democratic government and so forth. Not so in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was absolute law, absolute rule. Whatever he wanted, he got. Whatever he desired, he took. Every person in the nation belonged to his wishes. He could have whatever he wanted, and as his military conquest indicated, he could take whatever he wanted. This was a man of absolute power and dominion, unrivaled. And as he looks over Babylon, and by all accounts, Babylon was impressive. He had dedicated himself to building it up. There was double walls. There were gates. The wall was 40 feet high. They were wide enough for a chariot of four horses to turn around on it on top of the wall. He had built the hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the world, to please his wife and remind her of her mountain home. And he had built all of these things. And we can only imagine him walking out in his palace and surveying this overwhelming landscape of his construction, demonstrating his power and might and saying, is not this great Babylon? And a word falls from heaven, departed from you. He not only loses the kingdom, he loses his mind. He loses his humanity. He loses even a roof over his head. He is like an ox. He begins to eat grass. He is driven to insanity. The point seems to be, not only are you not able to hold on to your kingdom, you can't hold on to yourself. Nothing. You have nothing. The overwhelming lesson is repeated again in this section. You notice the, the repetition. This will happen to you. Interpretation. This will happen to you. 
It happens. This will happen to you. Notice down there again in verse 32 at the end. Until you know that the most high rules the kingdoms of men. What's the point for Nebuchadnezzar? You must acknowledge and surrender the absolute unchallengeable sovereignty of the most high God. And he is left like an ox, an insane man in a field. Gone the scepter, gone the armies, gone the palace, gone even the respect and accommodation of those around him, gone. He is driven, it says, from among men. Verse 34. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my Lord sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. And now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are right, and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. The emperor of the earth bows in worship to the emperor of the universe. He declares in this hymn of praise that there is no comparing to God. There is no overruling God. There is no limit to God's kingdom. And he declares further that mankind cannot even question God. There is no saying to him, what have you done? God's wisdom and his providence is beyond the questioning of mankind. It it says that men are accounted as nothing. It doesn't mean he doesn't care for men. It means that compared to God's power and greatness, even the greatest of men on earth is accounted as nothing, not worth even to be taken into account in comparison to the greatness of the sovereignty of God. Now, this is made the more remarkable because this is King Nebuchadnezzar declaring it. Any person who read this publication would would say, "If, if King Nebuchadnezzar can declare that God's dominion is absolute, that he rules over all, that he is deserving of praise, then there is no one excluded. Everyone must affirm this song of worship that none can stay his hand or, and no one can say to him, what have you done? This, this king of all earthly kings is declaring there is a higher king. He rules over all. No king is not ultimately simply a tool in the hand of the king of heaven, he says. He does according to his will. No one can stop him. No one can thwart him. Among earth, it is his will that is accomplished and established. What's he saying? I have surrendered to the absolute sovereignty of God. This story from the king of the ancient world is given down through history with an intention intention is there needs to be a conviction cemented in our heart 
God is absolutely sovereign in heaven and on earth. We need to cultivate, to re-examine, to re-cement this conviction. According to Nebuchadnezzar, we need to know he rules. No one can stay his hand. No one can counsel him. He needs no counsel. He needs no questioning. He must be declared to be the ultimate sovereignty in the universe. And you notice, just as Nebuchadnezzar was taken from power, he can be placed back in power. He humbles himself, and God chooses in his wisdom to lift him back up again, to place him on his throne. The reversal in this passage is just as astonishing in either direction. The emperor is taken from his throne room out in a field, forgotten as a beast. And then just as surprising, they take the former crazy man and restore him to his throne over the whole world. This makes no human sense. Wasn't there someone else that could have taken power during this extended time when he's in the field? Surely some ambitious prince could have taken over control of the kingdom. But that's exactly the point. God will do what he chooses to do. And if he chooses to take a stump in a field and make him the emperor of the world, he can do that. If the ox man can start giving direction to their next military conquest towards Egypt, he can do that. God is absolutely sovereign. That's the point of this story. Now, let's apply it. Four applications for this story of Nebuchadnezzar for us. How, how do we apply? What does this do for us? What does it cultivate in us when we establish and cement in this conviction of God's sovereignty over the affairs of the world? Application number one. God's sovereignty is a comfort to his vulnerable people. It's a comfort. It's a comfort to them. Imagine the average 24-year-old Israelite whose nation has been ping-ponged back and forth over the last couple of centuries, who feels completely vulnerable against the might first of Assyria and then of Babylon and then of Persia, eventually of the Greek Empire. And they read this book from Daniel, this testimony from the emperor of the world. It's intended to comfort them. Look, everything you see may indicate that there is human power men that are beyond your comprehension. It may be impossible for you to imagine any kind of power above the kind of display of power you see on a daily basis. It may be impossible for you to imagine this, but your eyes don't work very well because if you could see what's really going on, you would see a hand above all of those kings moving them like pieces on a chessboard. There is a king above kings. There is a greatness above what your eyes can see. Be comforted. And you know who he is. Imagine the comfort of a, an Israelite who, who walked past the temples of foreign gods and, and knew they were in exile uh, to these people who worshipped pagan entities. They would have thought, well, maybe it's the case. Maybe it's the case that there, there really are just a lot of different powers and our God does the best he can. But in the end, he has to compete with, with powerful people and powerful deities. And, and it, it, you know, sometimes we're not really worthy of all of his strength. And so he's not going to help us that much. And what could he do anyway? Have you seen their armies? And this story from the king of the world is intended to comfort them. The one who rules over it all is your God. The one who controls even the greatest king of time that it had ever seen, he's your God. The one who can lift out of the plain of Babylon, this mighty city of Babylon, can be reduced to nothing by your God. Imagine the comfort to this this poor young Israelite who's looking at the decimation of the land of Israel and wondering, what do I have but chaos? What do I have but vulnerability? What do I have but weakness? And the same is true today. We're not exiled politically in the way that Daniel and his people were. 
because God's people are not limited to a nation anymore, but we are still in exile from our ultimate homeland. And we live in a world in which human pagan rulers rise up and fall down, and God's people throughout the world can feel vulnerable to their influence and the power, throne rooms of the culture, and we can look at it and say, what, what, what can I do against this kind of might and power? And this chapter is designed to encourage us. There is a power beyond all those powers, and you know his name. Your God controls those that control this earth. Your God. Your covenant-keeping God. Yahweh. He controls it all. Even the mightiest, most powerful, most irresistible ruler, down to the boss of every employee, God rules over them all. It would be a comfort. Now, this comfort is not a simplistic comfort because it comes with a degree of difficulty. As any mature Christian can tell you, the sovereignty of God is at the same time comforting and mysterious as it would have been for anybody reading this, this chapter. Well, God, if, if you can humble Nebuchadnezzar to the dust, then why did you put him in place in the first place? Why did you allow him to do those things to Jerusalem? I, I know it's because of our sin, but, but they're just as sinful as we are. And why have you raised up other sinful rulers over the centuries? God, if, if you're really this powerful, why do evil things and people in power do the things they do? Why, do, why don't you just eliminate it all? Almost every Christian I've ever known struggles with that question at some point in their life. And here's the difficulty of it. The Bible does not provide the answer that eliminates the mystery. It just doesn't. It says that it's true, and it leaves it for us to trust and believe. It leaves it to us to respond the way Nebuchadnezzar does and say, no one can say to him, what have you done? His ways are just. It's hard. It's hard for Christians to believe in the kind of power that can take Nebuchadnezzar and make him a stump in a field and then restore him immediately to his kingdom. Because God that can do that can do anything with anybody. It's hard. If you've never grappled with the biblical picture of the sovereignty of God over people, even over sinful people, I would encourage you to study it because sooner or later you're going to face a temptation in your faith and you're going to wonder, how can it be that God, who is supposedly good, controls such evil emperors? How can it be? And most shipwrecks of faith and heresies result in people demanding an answer to a mystery that God will not provide. Most shipwrecks of faith come from people demanding an answer to a mystery that God will not provide. He does not explain how it's possible that he can be all good, all powerful, all wise, and there still be evil people in the world. He just doesn't explain that. He, he gives promises that all will work out for good for his people. He gives promises that in the end, justice will reign. Certainly, there's some element here where he allows people to choose freely, but ultimately, even what they choose freely is under his sovereignty. On the one hand, he controls all. On the other hand, people always do exactly what they want. There is no simple answer to that mystery. There is simply bowing and trusting. Charles Spurgeon says, No doctrine in the whole word of God has more excited the hatred of mankind than the truth of the absolute sovereignty of God. This passage and passages like it are a reason people choose to reject God. They choose to not do what Nebuchadnezzar did. But 
Charles Spurgeon points us to a different way. He says this, why, why am I so curious to know the reason of my Lord's providences, the motive of his actions, and the design of his visitations? Shall I ever be able to clasp the sun in my fist and hold the universe in my palm? Yet these are as a drop of a bucket compared with the Lord my God. Let me not strive to understand the infinite, but spend my strength in love." What I cannot gain by intellect, I can possess by affection. And let that suffice me. What I cannot gain by intellect, I can possess by affection. And let that suffice me. Ultimately, a humble trust in the absolute sovereignty of God is comforting to his people, not because they understand how that's possible, simply because they entrust themselves to him. My situation, my life, my circumstances, my sufferings, my relationships, my marriage, my children, my nation, my culture, ultimately, the most high rules. And no one can say to him, what have you done? It's a comfort to his vulnerable people. Application number two. Application number two. God's sovereignty is a message for his witnesses. A message for his witnesses. I don't think the main point of this story, but certainly worth noting that both Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar himself give witness to the sovereignty of God. Daniel, like a good prophet of Israel, declares to Nebuchadnezzar, God is sovereign and you must turn and bow to him. And even Nebuchadnezzar, when he finally comes to grips with God's greatness, declares the same thing. God is sovereign and all kings and people must acknowledge his sovereignty. And every person that knows the God of heaven has this responsibility and privilege as well. Christians have this responsibility and privilege as well to say, God is sovereign and all must bow to him. And no one can say to him, what have you done? And I think in our day and age, which is increasingly post-Christian, there's going to have to be conversations we have with people that begin with the, the definition of God as God. Maybe 50 years ago, people had a a basic belief in God, and and maybe the the testimony could focus more immediately on, uh, well, you need to repent, and there's a way of salvation. Often, in, in today's age, we have to begin by saying, there is a God, and he rules over all, and all belong to him, and you belong to him, and you cannot turn to your own salvation because you first belong to this God. And the message of Daniel and ultimately the message of Nebuchadnezzar should be on the mouths of every Christian. The most high rules. We we notice this when Paul goes and speaks to the Greeks. He starts out his testimony a bit differently than he does with his Jewish family members and friends in the synagogue who know ultimately about God. He wants to tell them about about Jesus right away. With, With the Greeks, he begins at a place of saying, look, look, there is a God who rules over all these gods that you're worshiping. You have to start with him. If you don't get God, you're you're never going to get the gospel of God. God's sovereignty is a message for his witnesses. Application number three. God's sovereignty is a warning to the proud and a motive toward humility. A warning to the proud and a motive toward humility. Now, I, I don't think that the average a person would have related to Nebuchadnezzar. I don't think they, we, we Americans have a, a kind of an exalted view of ourselves. So we read this story and almost immediately the instinct is, I'm supposed to identify with Nebuchadnezzar. So don't be proud like him. I think that's somewhat unique to us. I think in the, in the old days when they would have read this story, no, nope, that would not have crossed their mind at first. They wouldn't have thought, yeah, this is a story about people don't be proud. No, no, no. <laughs> no nobody relates to Nebuchadnezzar. But I think in his story, they would have seen a a sort of a symbolic replaying of the story of the people of God. 
And they would have derived some degree of hope from it. Notice, notice it says to him that he's going to be a stump in a field. Well, they had been told previous to the exile in Isaiah chapter 6, 11 through 13, the following. Isaiah said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people. And the land is a desolate waste. And the Lord removes, removes people, notice the similarities, far away. And the forsaken places are many in the place, midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it shall be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. I think the, the Israelite who's studying his Bible would, would hear the story of Nebuchadnezzar and say, I, I, I can relate to that. We also boasted and were proud as God's people. Our kings also defied and denied the Holy One, and ultimately our glory was also stripped from us, and we were left like a stump in a field. But, but, in watching Nebuchadnezzar's story, they would also derive hope. God left a stump for us as well. And this stump was restored. Perhaps that holy seed that God left for his people can be restored as well. Perhaps there's a, a rescue. Perhaps there's a restoration. If we humble ourselves as God's people, perhaps there's a, a restoration that God's people can experience again, a, a, a revival. Perhaps God will, will lift us up, even as he did this pagan king. And I think there is a, a message, both for God's people and for anyone. Look, God resists the proud, but he does give grace to the humble. If you defy and reject God, eventually you will be cut down by God. But if you will humble yourselves and acknowledge that the Most High rules and repent of your sins and practice righteousness and reflect His mercy and honor His wisdom and sovereignty and embrace His offer of salvation, well, then you also can be lifted up and your true humanity can be restored. God's sovereignty is a warning to the proud and a motive towards humility. Notice in this passage that the warning precedes the judgment. And there's this period of time when the humble, that the proud can humble himself. And there's a, there's a warning there. Look, look, take advantage of a warning. And I think all of God's people would, would experience the same thing. Look, where is there, there this same kind of pride in my heart where I lift myself up towards heaven? Where, where I, do I see this kind of arrogance and boasting? And where should I be bowing before the absolute sovereignty of God? They, they could look at Nebuchadnezzar and say, yes, we did that as well. We, as your people, looked like this pagan king, and we boasted. But now, Lord, we humble ourselves and we say that you are sovereign and you are glorious and you are above all. God's sovereignty is a warning to the proud and a motive towards humility. Finally, God's sovereignty is revealed in his ultimate king. It's revealed in his ultimate king. I want you to notice something in this passage, in the dream, and then the fact that the dream is repeated again, notice the almost surprisingly positive way that Nebuchadnezzar's rule is defined. Did you notice that? It's, it's surprising, actually. There's a tree, in verse 10, in the midst of the earth. Its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its top reached to heaven. It was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. And all flesh, it says, was fed from it. Now, this is certainly taking the best <laughs> picture that you could of Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, this is Nebuchadnezzar in his most positive light, this cosmic tree that provides... You can imagine an Israelite exile reading this and thinking, uh, so... Like, he's providing food while he's decimating cities and, like, ravaging people and making slaves of whole nations. And this is an incredibly positive way of viewing this emperor, this benevolent tree that provides food for all and shade. And I think the average Egyptian or Israelite would say, I, I, I wasn't experiencing a lot of shade under Nebuchadnezzar, okay? This was not like a shade experience. 
There's a, there's a bit of a surprising positive nature, but I think in that there's something of a clue of God's intention. In Romans 13 in the New Testament, we're told that even non-Christian rulers and authorities are put in place by God to do good to people and to punish evildoers. So we could say, and this is true from the very beginning of the Bible, God's intention was always to have a human regent providing for and caring for his creation. We can go all the way back to Adam and Eve. In the sense, God didn't rule his people directly. And since God is this sovereign, we know he could have. But in God's wisdom, he decided to raise up governments. And even in the fallen world, fallen creation, he continues to provide through human governments. And they more or less do what he intended in rewarding the good and punishing the evil. Some atrociously fail and some do a little bit better. But the ideal of God is to have a human ruler that will be like Nebuchadnezzar, who will provide shade for all, food for all, protection for all, will grow to fill the whole earth. That there's, a, there's a sense of the idealistic in the description of Nebuchadnezzar. And there's a sense of God's view of what has happened over and over again in history in his being stripped down and pulled apart and left as a stump because... What he was supposed to be, he utterly wasn't, namely in his pride. Now, this pattern, you could imagine an Israelite reading this and thinking, wouldn't it be marvelous if there was a tree like that? A tree king like that? I mean, David was sort of like that. He he provided and he was a, a tree and he just seemed to fill everything and take over and he just was a wise ruler most of the time wouldn't it be marvelous to have a person like that and how will God's kingly dominion which has always been displayed on earth through a human regent how how will we reconcile these things you can imagine an Israelite scholar thinking about that how is God going to do this His dominion rules over all. I just heard uh, two chapters ago that his kingdom is going to fill the whole earth and rule over the whole earth. There's going to be a stone. It's going to fill all of creation. But God has always had a human ruler who functioned like that tree. How's he going to do this? Sometimes in the Old Testament, we get explicit declarations of what God promises. And sometimes you get something like an outline. I don't know a lot about photography and art, but there's something like a negative. It's like a negative, and all you see is what could be. And sometimes when you're reading the Old Testament, that's exactly part of the point. This happens over and over in the book of Judges. You see these leaders, and you see mostly how bad they are, and in contrast, you see, okay, what, this is what they could be. I think the same is true here. This tree of life that provides for all, who is a king, who ultimately is chopped down because of his pride, paints in negative what God's plan, we know from the New Testament, ultimately will be for this earth. And what he's already said in this book, that there's going to be a mountain that's going to fill the whole earth. And in this case, the mountain might be described as a tree. And in just a couple of chapters, you're going to describe him as a son of man who's going to have dominion. So there is a person that's going to more perfectly and actually perfectly represent this dominion, this tree. But in his case, he's not going to be a boasting, proud monarch looking to exalt himself. He's actually going to humble himself to provide for all mankind. He's not going to lift himself up. He's going to lower himself down. There's going to be a king of kings who rules over the nations who's going to make himself in the form of a servant who's going to die on a cross so that people can be fed from his death. 
He's going to provide shade for them through his death and resurrection so that they can escape the blazing heat of God's judgment. There's going to be a king like that, and he's going to be the king of kings. But unlike proud Nebuchadnezzar, he's going to lower himself down so that, as Isaiah 53 says, he's not even going to have the appearance of a man. He will be driven from mankind. He will be forsaken and left and only finally restored after he takes on the sins of all of his people. There's going to be a king like that. And the sort of negative contrast hint that Nebuchadnezzar is that just would leave an Israelite, oh, I wish, I wish there was a king. And, and I wish he was a true worshiper of God and not this pagan ruler. What, what would it be like if there could be a king that would fill the whole earth and provide and protect and preserve his people and feed them and who wouldn't be proud but would humble himself and would save us? What would it be like if there was a king like that? Well, brothers and sisters, we know the fill-in for that picture. We know the identity of that king, the identity of that tree of life. We know who that is. And the New Testament says, Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he will indeed fill the whole earth, and his glory will cover it as the waters cover the sea, and he will provide shade and salvation for his people. He will be the rock and refuge, and he will not be this proud king who seeks to take kingdoms by his own might, but he he will declare, worship the Lord, and him only will you serve. He will not reject God's word, but he will say, man does not live by bread alone, but he lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He will not take the kingdoms for himself alone, but for the good of his people by going to the cross and dying to save them. And that holy seed left like a stump or as Isaiah described him as a root out of dry ground, he will be exalted. Not because he was proud, but because he humbled himself to save the proud. And he will be lifted up, and he will be that tree forever. The book of Daniel is about the sovereignty of God. And throughout the book, there's these hints of what that sovereignty could look like. Hints that could only finally be fulfilled in the New Testament testimony of Jesus Christ, the sovereign God-man ruler over this world. So when you're reading this chapter about the greatest human emperor of the world at that time and seeing his humiliation and exaltation, you can be comforted. God rules over current people, nations, bosses, employers. You can be comforted. He rules over them all. It's mysterious, but it's comforting. You can be emboldened to tell about him to those that need to repent. You should be humbled to reject pride, not exalt ourselves above him. And ultimately, you can rejoice. We've been given the king who is the tree of life. And under his shade and protection, we are provided for forever. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we rejoice and exult in the King of kings, the one who rules over all. And ultimately, Lord, we thank you that you set over men, whomever you choose, and thank you, Father, for choosing your Son. Thank you for placing him on the throne of history. What a choice, Lord. What a perfect choice. We rejoice that you set him over all. Lord, we receive the comfort of knowing you are sovereign. We humble ourselves before you and we trust in you, King of kings and Lord of lords. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.